I would like to welcome you to class number 17 in the UBC ecosystem modeling course called FISH 501. Uh, the topics today is going to be uh, maximum sustainable yield, optimum fishing and policy search. And I have something like uh, three person, no, five uh, presentations outlined. And very optimistically and unrealistically, I'm expecting to do that in one hour so that we will have the second hour for actually looking at the implementation of maximum sustainable yield and, and, and efficient policy search in ECOSIM. I would like to acknowledge that UBC is at Coast Salis territory and we acknowledge that we are at the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Mosquim, Slelwatut and Squamish people. Uh, a reminder that the recordings of this are available at the Ecopart YouTube channel and also the Ecopart uh, Facebook page, where some of you may be watching it now and you are most welcome on Facebook Live to put questions uh, and we'll ask them as we go along. It is just a reminder again that there is a course website uh, where you can find all the presentations, tutorials and other, and other things, readings too. And there's also a Slack channel, and if you don't have access to it, just send me an email and uh, I will get you on the Slack workspace where you can find all the readings and other things. And with that, we finished with number one, slide, uh, presentation number one. If we continue like this, we'll be done in 10 minutes uh, with the whole class. So um, next thing would be, which one should we take? Let's take the one about MSY Santiago. Fantastic. The first thing we're going to be talking about is biomass dynamic models and maximum sustainable yield. The first part of that biomass dynamic models, that's the standard type of models that uh, are like ECOSIM, where what happens in the next time step depends on the biomass of the pool and what happens to it, how it grows and how it dies. And we're going to see how we can model maximum sustainable yield with such a model. And here you have to remember that the simplest model you can use to address a question is often the best model to use. And in, the, in that case here, the biomass dynamic models are simpler than the fully age-structured assessment models. We can use those as well, including in ECOSIM and ECOSPACE, but as a starting point, it's biomass dynamic models. So that's that part of the title. Now the other part of the title relates to maximum sustainable yield. How much can we safely extract over extended sustainable period? So that's what we're asking. And traditionally this is done on a species by species basis. Maximum sustainable yield is really the foundation for fisheries management. Uh, that's what most countries uh, have as a uh, target to max to um, manage fisheries so as to obtain maximum sustainable yield. It's not. There are issues with that and we'll be talking about some of those as we go along. But the next slide, oh yes, um, gives a representation of an ecosystem. This is Kingman Reef down way out in the Pacific. And I'm bringing this up because of using the opportunity to talk a little bit more about carrying capacity, how things relate, how ecosystems relate to carrying capacity. And this is where I'm inclined to make a small break in the presentation and talk a little bit more about Kingland Reef. Just show you a few slides which I find very impressive. So this is a story from National Geographic from July 2008 called An Uneasy Eden. It's about a reef, Kingman Reef, several thousand miles from anything. So very low fishing pressure here. And uh, they, National Geographic sent a, a group of divers out there and this was, published this in 2008. And what they found there was a top predator dominated ecosystem. Very far from the Bio, rich biodiversity, rich 
healthy reef we think of when we see all the reefs with all the, the planktivores, the swarms of fish. This is a reef that's dominated by top predators, accounting for 85% of the fish biomass and they force, as they say here, most prey into hiding. That's where they are hiding in between the reefs. It's a dangerous world to be a small fish in. There are fish in there, but they are small, they are scared, and you don't see the huge schools that you see on healthy reef, says this photographer. So you have a lot of top predators. You have the small ones hiding. The small ones are still eating, uh, still relying on advection of plankton to the reef. The big ones are hanging around and are hungry. And Vixala said they want to taste us, they come and they, they bite, see it. So we're talking here about inverted pyramids. We're talking about systems where you have a huge biomass of long-lived fish that sticks around and hangs around and have a really slow turnover, low mortality, low production. They are close to their carrying capacity. That's what that boils down to. In ecosystem, that means that you will be using what we call vulnerability, which we should be talking a bit more about at some point. Uh, we'll be using vulnerabilities that are very close to one because these top predators, they cannot increase the predation mortality they are causing on their prey. It's already at the maximum. So if they were to grow to carrying capacity, how many times could they increase their predation mortality? That's what we are looking at with the, what we call the vulnerability in ecosystem. And the answer here would be but one. They can't increase it anymore. Now this is the system, the undisturbed system that we're talking about here. And we could just see if I can get this to work again. Well, it started well. So we're back to talking about maximum sustainable you and we're back to talking about this. So here we are carrying capacity. I'm going to put this dome shaped curve on top of it because uh, that's how we model maximum sustainable yield. The curve may change a little bit, but this is the concept. When you are all the way out on your right, out here in the top, in the lower right corner, that's you can think of the of the x-axis here, the horizontal line there as being the biomass of these top predators. So there maybe this shark here. Um, when they are out here on in the lower right corner, that's our Kingman Reef. And y-axis is the surplus production in this system. There is no surplus production out here, a very, very, very little surplus production. Because these groups, they can't produce any more really, when, we, when we're looking at from their perspective, from the top predator's perspective. They are at carrying capacity. The planktivores, they are not there, they are way down uh, on... Uh, on this axis here. So they have a surplus production. That's what's being eaten by... Uh, um, that's what's being eaten there. They're far from their carrying capacity. But not the um, not the top predators. So this is what we're trying to model, or want to model, when we're modeling maximum sustainable yield. I'll give you one more example of this, because we're talking about maximum sustainable yield and long-term effects, sustainability. This is how uh, North America was, I was just about to say, invaded by uh, Europeans and what caused that. Um, it was caught that brought people from, uh, from Europe over here to, for fishing. You know, they came over in, in spring and stayed and went home in the autumn uh, for hundreds of years, fishing caught up on the, up on the banks. The level of, of catches, this is a reconstruction that was done by George Rose, who is an associate professor now at, 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 here at our institute at UBC. He was uh, his true heart. Before retirement, he was on the East Coast and working on cod. So he re has reconstructed the history of cod fishing up on the Grand Banks. And uh, you can see here landings for, for hundreds of years 
being there in the uh, hundred thousand dollar range, hundred thousand tons range, with ups and downs, largely associated with the climates and 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 other events, but uh, sustained catch, and then it built there in the uh, uh, when in, when things industrialized, and there was a big peak in seventies uh, where it was a free for all fishing off the 12 mile uh, uh, 12 mile national boundary what's it called 12 mile limit and that led to a huge expansion for a few years catches uh, went up to over a million tons uh, Canada then along with a number of other countries instituted a 200 mile exclusive economic zone and that brought fishing down and in our infinite wisdom here in Canada, that led to a building of ships and an increase in gain catches and then a collapse. And the fishery has not recovered in the 20 years, 25 years that has uh, um, went by since then. It's still at a very low level. Now, catches tells us something about the history of, of course, of interest in the, to know how much fish was there in the sea. So George Rose reconstructed that as well, and uh, you can see here biomass indicating something up around the seven million ton as how far up they probably were, and then uh, a period here with adverse in, in the eighteen hundreds with adverse environmental condition leading to decline and then the build up again, but no collapses as such. Uh, in after this collapse here in the 70s, uh, we had a mixture happening of overfishing and environmental conditions. Possibly also some food web effects, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later this morning. But this is basically the story. So, what's the maximum sustainable yield here? Hmm. One thing you can see from, from this is well, there certainly is a maximum sustainable, uh, sustainable yield over hundreds of years. And during that period, even adverse environmental conditions didn't lead to a crash in the, in the population or in the catches because there was capital in the bank. But later on here, this is, this is what has happened. So that's what we're trying to come up with answers to that question about what is the maximum sustainable yield? How much fish can we safely take? And the story there is that without surplus production, if we didn't have that dome-shaped curve you saw a little while ago, fisheries would not be sustainable. We need that surplus production. In other words, as we reduce the biomass, productivity goes up. If that wasn't the case, we would all fisheries would collapse right away. And the biomass dynamic models, like those that are in the core ecosystem implementation, core ecosystem being, if you define in ecopart your group as a biomass dynamic group, then this is what it will do. You have the option in ecopart of saying, no, I'd like to, to make it as a age structure group, a multi stanza group. We we'll talk about that. And then it uses a slightly different approach, but the same principle. We'll, we'll talk more about that this morning. Now, Russell, back almost 100 years ago, defined then how to model that. He said, the biomass next year is the biomass this year, the BT, plus growth plus reproduction, minus natural mortality, predation mortality, or other mortality. Diseases, predation is in the, hidden in this M here. So you add these factors here, subtract the natural mortality, and subtract the catches. Very simple equation. Which can also be written as, well, these three parameters here, growth, reproduction, and natural mortality, they are a function of how many are there right now in the system. So that's here. Biomass next year is the biomass this year, plus a function 
or something that's a function of the biomass this year, less the catches, how much we take out. Now, all biomass dynamic models use some kind of a variant of this equation. So this is what you'll find in many different models, ecosystem models and, and other models. A few more steps. The next one is logistic population growth. When we looked at the sharks out in Kenyan Reef, uh, they were close to carrying capacity and the population wouldn't grow anymore once you're out there because they are at carrying capacity. It's, it really is that simple. So if you start off with a group, again, you can, ex you can Im imagine that uh, we just took and removed uh, all those, uh, almost all the sharks on Kingland Reef and brought it down to, well, let's say two sharks, just for reproductive purposes. Uh, you could expect that they would grow and, and nothing else happened there. They would grow exponentially first and then grow back over a period of maybe a hundred years to their carrying capacity. So they would follow such a logistic uh, grow, uh, population growth model, which can be modeled by including something about carrying capacity. So that's the equation we have here and it goes back to Verhulst and Malthus who was working on human populations. It says the change first d b t plus one or d t the change in uh, the change in population size this year is a growth factor r times how many are there this is what will give us exponential growth in the beginning when you start the curve this r times b t so if that's r is 0.05 you're, it will grow five percent first from this year to the next year if the biomass is really low if you look at this term here in, in the bracket one minus the biomass this year relative to its carrying capacity so if the biomass is really small this year becomes oh close to zero so then it says just r or b so in the beginning when we're down here when b is really small we grow with the factor r when we get to Kingman Reef out here on the right, the biomasses are close to carrying capacity. The Bt is close to K. So this ratio becomes 1. And that means 1 minus 1 is nothing. 0. 0 times something means the growth is nothing. 0. That's our Kingman Reef. So that's the logistic population growth. So uh, the shape there we saw earlier, with it being something with the peak in the middle, uh, people realize, ooh, that uh, may overestimate uh, where we get surplus production at half the carrying capacity. It's, and you can modify that. Pedan Thompson did that by putting in an exponent here. And Fox, in the Fox model, uh, it's log B divided by log K. And we'll see on the next slide uh, what what the result is of this. So here the Schaeffer model is that the, the um, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here pointing my mouse pointer on it. It worked before but it doesn't work when it's <laughs> Santiago's um, screen we're looking at. So the dark blue that's the, that's the Schaeffer model and it has that the top is at half of carrying capacity. That's where the maximum production is. That's where it's most steep as on, on the growth curve. Um, for the other models, uh, you can, you can, um, or oh, sorry, for the uh, Pelotonson, you can, based on what your exponent is, you can move that to fit your data better. And um, the, um, the Fox model is more shifted down in that range there around 0.3 to 0.4 that you when you're 30 to 40 percent of carrying capacity you, uh, you that's where you get the, the maximum uh, surplus production but this is what we're looking for and this is what we're modeling with with it okay next uh, how it's implemented in ecosim is really just what we were talking about before 
um, I don't even, well, C times Q is production here. That is how much the consume times the conversion factor. And then, so that's that's our growth, less how um, how much is being, uh, how much is dying, how much is immigrate. But this is ex really the same as we saw earlier in, uh, when we talked about Ecopart and we talk, when we introduced Ecosim. So let's just skip on, you have them here, to the next. Now we get into implementation, uh, and I'm going to show you that in, uh, in maybe in a half hour's time. In Ecosim, we can go in and we can for um, we can run the model and we'll produce graphs like this. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, what it does in the background is it does a really long term run. In this case here, this is an old version of Andrew Bay where there was a fleet called Foragers that was the one facing for macro and, and anchovy. And um, what it does is it does a really run, long run, like a thousand years. And it start off with no fishing, really low fishing effort. And then for that fleet, it gradually increases the effort. So in this case here, up to 20 times the uh, original uh, effort. But it does that in small steps, so it goes from, let's say, from point one to uh, from one to point one to point two, point three, and each time it it waits maybe twenty years or thirty years, depending on the model uh, how things how fast things are moving, and then uh, it runs for another so zero for thirty years, and then point one effort for thirty years, and then point two. 30 years and it continues like that for a very long time and it maps out the reaction of each group and what you see here is for blue is anchovy and there is the blue that has the solid in the middle there around 8 on the x-axis fishing effort multiplier if you increase the fishing effort about 8 times you're getting the solid blue curve uh, oh, 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 let me be sure here. That's the ah okay. You're getting that estimate there. So that's uh, says the relative catch could be three point something times bigger. Now there's also a stippled blue one that one, which tends to be lower. It's called stationary system. Now that's if we make this one more run where we are changing the uh, fishing effort for for anchovy or for, the, for this group here, but we are leaving the rest of the system unchanged. That's not a good explanation. Let me try again. Those two graphs shows the difference between what we predict with an ecosystem model, that's the solid line, and the single species model, that's the dotted line. We are running Ecosim for both, but for the solid line, what happens there is that when you are fishing harder for anchovy, that's going to have an impact on their predators. So their predators will get less anchovy. And because of that, anchovy can tolerate a higher catch than if you didn't think about it. If you didn't incorporate that effect. I can't see you really well, but I can sense that this is not going well across. Santiago, do you want to explain it? Yeah. So in the way I, I understand it is that when we are running the, the the one which is not stationary, we are including predator-prey interactions as well. 
as what's happening to the Yeah, that's, that's the normal ecosystem model with all predator prey interactions. Yeah. Yep. And when we run the stationary one, we are kind of running a single species stock assessment. Uh, or yeah. like a. Hmm. Yeah. In, in reality, yeah, what, we run, what we run there is we're still running ecosystem, but we're fixing the biomass of all the predator and prey and um and also the uh, competitors so as we are reducing as we're fishing harder on the anchovy their predators will suffer so there'll be fewer predators but their prey will do better so there'll be more food for the remaining anchovy so therefore anchovy will do better and can tolerate a higher fishing pressure under these conditions it's a little bit complicated to explain but you, when you think about it the logic is quite clear oh yes it should have this effect this doesn't mean that this also means that you know it's not so that when we're taking in ecosystem consideration into it that that means we have to be more careful not necessarily there are ecosystem effects and those effects can well be that as we fish harder there are consequences that um, are not well in, there are consequences and we have and what the food web model the ecosystem model allows us to do is to explore what those consequences are that's a really complicated way of explaining it let's have a look at the next slide yeah i i, I now have a question for later <laughs> Okay, um, we can take it. Oh no, I, I, I mean, the, what 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 you're saying here is that compensation or will, will will allow the 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 target species to 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 sustain uh, much harder exploitation. So, yeah. could you maybe touch up a, a, a little bit more, or, or or on how does this this balanced harvesting approach differs from this logic? Well, the harvest balancing uh, relates to uh, fishing all the species at a proportion of their productivity. So fish through, our, through the ecosystem. Let's take this here and, then, and have a, a different way of explaining it. The first thing you have to do on this slide here is just ignore the one with the stipple line called anchovy stationary. And th then the rest of the, of the plots here uh, are the ones we'll be concentrating on first. So the one called anchovy full con compensation, that shows here, as you increase the F, so here's not effort, here we're looking right at anchovy. You can see up in the top left that what we are running is anchovy, so it's by group, and it's anchovy. You can see that in the top left. So in this case here, we are changing the fishing mortality in a long-term run for anchovy from zero up to two to two, so F of two. That means uh, close to, that means 96 or 7% exploitation when you get up to fish mortality of two. Now, the surplus production for this group here, anchovy, is estimated to be a fish mortality around 1.3. That's where you have the uh, vertical yellow line going up to anchovy full compensation. So this is what happens to anchovy, to the relative catch of anchovy. Now, when you look at the plot for whiting, you can see what's the relative catch for whiting. And you can see as you increase the fishing mortality on anchovy, the catch of whiting goes down because whiting are losing an important prey in anchovy. We are taking more anchovy, there'll be less for whiting, therefore it goes down. Whiting eat cod a little bit. So therefore, when you look at this, and cod doesn't eat anchovy, therefore cod, oh, are doing better. And because whiting eats shrimp, you can see a big effect on shrimp in here. So you get more cats of shrimp we don't we don't fish differently for shrimp it's the same effort we're only doing something to anchovy yet we are 
increasing the catch of shrimp three or four times because of growth in shrimp population because there are fewer whiting. And mackerel declines too because they eat anchovy. So that's what it does. If in this run we keep whiting, shrimp, cod, mackerel, seals constant over time, we don't take the ecosystem effects, we get a stationary system. And that's what the curve I didn't want to talk about, the one called anchovy stat shows you. That's how it would look. You'll see for this one, F is estimated, F that gives you F M S Y, the F that gives you maximum sustainable yield is much lower. It's 0.8. And you'll see when you get up to 1.5, you see a collapse in anchovy. It's still subjected to the same amount of predation. It doesn't benefit from getting more prey. That's why it's happening at a lower F. You have to check it. Sometimes these routines uh, don't behave well. And that can, it's very often has to do with parameterization in the model. Uh, and that often, that can lead to you have to go back and check uh, how, how your model uh, how you model behave, is this reasonable? How does this fit into what we know from single species assessment about MSY? What's, what's the differences there? Um, that is necessary. You can't just run it and say, oh, I'm getting 6.4, this is fantastic. You know, you really have to go in and, and check it a bit. And it, it, yeah, it calls for, for sitting down and, and looking at it a little bit more careful. Um, the a really important aspect of this is where is our start situation? Where are we on that axis I showed you on the on the Kingman Reef from zero to carrying capacity? Remember vulnerability that the default setting is two, that we are where a predator can double the predation mortality. By default, the assumption is that we are where a predator can double the predation mortality is causing on its prey. That's, uh, that's the assumption. We have to have something in there uh, to get started. That's what you, when you're fitting the model, that's what you look for. When we are dealing with biomass dynamic, it does not fully consider stock recruitment relationships. It does to, to some extent in the sense that uh, the steepness in these curves. It does th that, you know, when you are decreasing the biomass, it m then the group may become more productive. And that's the reason why it may become more productive is that uh, there may be fewer predators, there may be more prey for them. That's uh, it, that may, uh, matters for it. But we get a more explicit representation that of this if we use multi stanza groups. And um, if we use multi stanza groups, we get a better Well, yeah, we don't in in uh, in ecosystem we don't have a stock recruitment curve built in as many models will have it. The stock the recruitment is a function of the conditions that a group experiences. Just like you saw for entry, what happened to that one? It wasn't recruitment as such; it was biomass dynamics. But if it was a multi stanza group, it would be recruitment as such. How many young ones are produced? Uh, and it really matters. Um, so that's one aspect of it. I also put this uh, slide in here to uh, mention that one thing that's quite clear is that when we're looking at this, we cannot have maintain all stocks at maximum sustainable yield level. Uh, that's what they have to do in the US with the Maxim Stevenson Act. It's, it's legislated. Europe is trying to do the same. And if you just looked, if you just think about the previous slide, the one where we had the anchovy and the impact on whiting and so on, uh, how would you get maximum sustainable yield of whiting and anchovy at the same time? You can't, because they depend on each other. So if you, you have to prioritize, you can't get, if you estimate the maximum sustainable yield for whiting, for cod, for 
uh, anchovy, for uh, mackerel, and for shrimp in, in our anchovy bay model. You estimate those five, one by one, and you sum it up. You're getting less than you can get at the ecosystem level. And that's what we'll be talking about a little bit later today in the fifth presentation this morning. Uh, but that's what um, that's the, that's how it is, you know. Yeah. It says next presentation. Is that true? Was this this last one completely? Yeah, it is. Uh, it just starts ends here with uh, 1977 Avatar for the concept of NSY, written by Peter Larkin. Uh, Peter Larkin was um, a professor here at uh, at UBC. Uh, he was um, really a, a remarkable person, and he liked writing these poems, like this. And expressed in this, he was also vice president of UBC, dean and, and head of the was he head of the animal resource ecology lab there when um, at some point as well. Anyway, he. Uh, he was critical and wanted to bury the MSY and part of the reason was that it had been used by uh, Garland, Garland, and, uh, Garland and others to advocate uh, high, estimate too high yields. That's what uh, led to uh, the build-up of Anchoretta fishery in Peru and uh, to, to uh, too much capacity and, and uh, promising too much. However, this was 1977, and now it's, it's still around and still the foundation for much of fisheries management. Okay, let's go. I'm uh, Ray Hilborn, a professor at the University of Washington. I'm here in Washington today to testify before the Senate Subcommittee on uh, investigating Magnus and Stevens reauthorization. Uh, the essence of my testimony is that we have been very successful in the U.S. at rebuilding our fish stocks stopping overfishing, uh, that uh, many of our fisheries are now very economically profitable, uh, but many are not, that uh, the time has come to uh, refocus our fisheries policy on what we actually want to achieve, because rebuilding is only a means to an end. And do we want to maximize the economic value of our fisheries? Do we want to maximize jobs? Do we want to maximize food production? A uh, key element of my testimony is that the success has been achieved by following science advice. Uh, and I don't think that should change, but the science advice will change depending on what our objective is. And uh, quite simply, I'm suggesting that if Congress tells what they really want to achieve um, uh, in the mix of those things I mentioned, then the scientists can tell you how best to achieve them. Well, what, first, the most important thing we found is that for U.S. species, we really found no relationship between forage fish abundance and the uh, trend in their, their predators, that uh, the predators seem to go up or down largely independent of the, bunch of, uh, the abundance of, of forage fish. And we'll finish right there. And this is basically what we'll be talking about for the rest of it. So his core message is, predators seems to go up and down largely independent of the abundance of forage fish. And he asked them, what are the objectives for management? How do we tackle trade-offs? And that's a balance, as you see it in that lower right thing there, or in the right side there, between the, the predators and, and the prey populations when we manage to use two. And it very often shows up in the context of marine mammals, notably pinnipeds and forage fisheries. What, what are, how do we balance that? Of course, he was very optimistic to think that uh, he would get Congress to take a stand on this. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of difficult to get people to do. Managers are really, really adverse to getting into trade-offs because it's very easily meaning that uh, how is it robbing Peter to pay Paul? You get into that kind of questions. We'll turn to that. But uh, this is... Um, these are the issues that uh, that he's uh, he was dealing with, and that's what we'll be talking about next. So next, oh, there we go. There is a controversy. I call it the Lenfest Hillborn controversy. 
and uh, it relates to ecosystem modeling and to how we model the species interactions. So let me explain it. The Lenfest report came out a number some years ago, and it estimated the, it was about the economic importance of forest fisk. It estimated that, that economic importance to 16.9 billion US dollar, 5.6 in direct value, and then there was the ecosystem services that forage fish do by supporting other fisheries that are commercially important, and that was estimated to 11.3 billion. Now what they did in the uh, this Lenfest study was to use a number of ecosystem models, rather a number of ecopart model to evaluate that. And they used what I would call canned ecosystem models in the sense that it was not the people who made the models and it was not experienced EWE modelers who did this. And most of these fish in these models were multi, um, modeled with biomass dynamics, so not multi stanza. And as we just talked about, that means that the production of these one is a function of biomass and its feeding conditions. Let's go back to the Russell 1931 equations. Now, when we're looking at model comparisons, we learn that such implementations of models tend to overestimate fisheries impacts. There are a couple of references, some references to that here. So let's look a little bit closer at what's happening. That was a clue for you, Santiago. Yes. Um, well, the reaction to the Lenfest study came uh, from uh, Ray Hilborn's group here with a couple of studies saying predators may have less effect by cats of small species than previously taught. That's what he was uh, hinting to in, in the previous study. And the reason that Ray puts forward, you can see on the next slide here, he's saying basically fish and forage fisheries don't compete. And his argument is the uh, predators tend to be eating the, the plentiful juvenile fish. Fisheries tend to be concentrating on the adult fish. So uh, there's a separation there. As long as the juveniles get to spawn before uh, fishery takes place, it doesn't impact the fishery, doesn't really impact how many are being reproduced. Let's go to the next slide. This is his reason. If we are reducing the adult stock, and we have a stock recruitment relationship that looks like this. This is the Beverton Hold stock recruitment relationship, which is the most common relationship. It's, it's almost some, something that almost all fish populations will show something along those lines. There may, okay, you can, the argument is typically, is it the Beverton Hold relationship or is it the Ricker relationship? And the rigor relationship is uh, with the rigor curve, uh, which is basically, can you show how, yeah, something like that, that as you get more, a bigger spawning stock, recruitment go down. It can be because of cannibalism or, or some reason like this. But in that case, reducing the spawning stock as we do with fishery, is just going to meet, meet bigger recruitment. So think about it from, if you think about Ray's argument, oh, and what the predators are feeding on is the recruitment, is the juveniles. So we have to go, as long as we stay uh, outside the zone where there is recruitment overfishing. Now recruitment overfishing is if you get over to the left where there is a straight line going from Oiden up to where it levels off. If you are in that area and it's due to fishing, we call it recruitment overfishing. So if you're over there where recruitment becomes proportional to spawning stock, then your population is too low. And that's not what Ray is arguing for. He's arguing for we have to be at a safe place. We have to be over where the flat curve is or if it, for some species where there is, a, it bends down again. 
as long as we are over there, then there's very little competition between the two. Fishing will reduce the adult stock, not recruitment. So there's little impact of predators that eat juveniles. It's interesting to look at from that perspective, but there's a but. Santiago, you, are, you, you can read my mind. Predators eat the juveniles and fisheries cats eat fisheries cat adults is a best case scenario. Yeah, it works in some cases. It may be the case for many predatory fish. We may expect when we're thinking about this that the trade-offs are bigger for interactions between fisheries and marine mammals, pinnipeds and seabirds than it is between fisheries and piscivores, as Santiago calls them. So the predators that are in the sea. And that may very well be. Now, another aspect of this, which is getting a lot of uh, attention, is that, that the trade-offs can be two ways. Because it may well be that the marine mammal are first at the table. That means that they may be eating the um, adults of a species before the fishery takes them. Uh, one example of that is a paper that we had in, uh, in fisheries uh, in November that looks at stellar sea lion and uh, sockeye salmon, indicating that the declines in sockeye salmon may well be caused by stellar sea lion, that they have to pass through stellar sea lion, uh, a, wall, a, a wall of mouths of stellar sea lions as they come back from spawning. Ulicon is an iconic species for First Nations in BC and on the, here on the west coast of the, of the US as well. And in BC there's been a dramatic decline over the last 30 years or so in Ulicon returning to the rivers to spawn. That's also a period where we've seen a massive build-up of, of pinnipeds. And we know that they, they will be targeting. So that's why I'm saying predators may often be first at the table. I'm not giving prescriptions for what we do about it. Short of, I argue, we need to understand what's happening. We are now closing fisheries for no, if, for no good reason because of perceived competition, because of their perceived impact in some cases on uh, on. Uh, forage fisheries or shrimp fisheries um, and I'm arguing for let's try to understand what's happening and we can use ecosystem models as a tool for this. So let's go on. Um, one aspect of this we found is that yeah uh, Tim Ashington's study here, fishing amplifies forage fish population collapses. Once things collapse, uh, then it may be very difficult to get things back again. There can be a number of reasons for this. We'll look more into that. We found something similar in, in the second study here, predictions from simple predator prey theory about impacts of harvesting forage fisheries. Once you are in um, a situation where you have reduced a population. If we get closer to that collapse zone, it can be very difficult to get a population to come back again. We have to stay in the safe zone. That's the conclusion from these two papers here. And that's what we've seen, for instance, with cod. You know, after 25 years, they haven't come back. Here are some random uh, unspecified examples for, I just pulled out of the ISIS statistics for three uh, groups, which uh, where you see landings uh, declining severely and not really coming back again in spite of a, a couple of decades passing. Same for cod, same for many other species. Why is that? Uh, there can be many explanations, but those two um, previous studies indicate that. And an interesting study is this one here, 2008, which is a very, very simple study where we looked, we looked at surplus production dynamics in declining and recovering fish population. Nice title. 
asking question about what is it that leads to collapses in fish population. So we evaluated 110 stocks for this purpose and evaluated them in a very simple way. We just said surplus production is the biomass in, let's say, this year less the biomass in the previous year plus the catch. So it's, it's just the Russell equation that's in here. In order to do this, and the reason why we could do it for 110 stocks was all we need is biomasses from assessment and the catches. That's it. From that, you can estimate a surplus production from each year. It's kind of neat. It's so simple. It's actually so simple that it should always be done for any population where you have done an assessment. Look at what is this, what is the estimate surface production. And we're getting different shapes. And the most common shape we got in that study was the counterclockwise hook. That's what you see down here. It looks almost like a circle hook. So we are starting down. The time series start in the lower right corner. You can see that from the arrows. And then as you reduce the biomass, you see an increase in surplus production, very much like we would expect from, from all we've been talking about up to now. So you see how it builds up and then you get, uh, we are talking about, and then we get oh too far down and we see surplus production diminishing as you go all the way down in the left, left corner. And now you have a collapse population when you're down there, low biomass, low surplus production, and getting back again can be a very prolonged affair. Uh, this year is not too bad, but what we typically saw in those 110 stocks was that uh, for the, I can't remember if it was two thirds the shows, it was a, this was the most common shape, was that that coming back again from down the collapse was a slow process. It might be staying, biomass might slightly be recovering, and it took a long time before you got into a, 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 a real positive surplus production. It can be tedious to come back again. Now, why? Hmm. Uh, there can be several explanations for that. Uh, you heard from the Anchovy Bay story about how it impacted perch and prey and, and, and what happened there. That explains the general shape. But why is it slow coming back again? Why do it take this long? Two papers there, Essington paper and uh, Walters at L paper there, both of them at L. They talked about that the previous slide, but let's go to the next slide. This is one uh, possible explanation for it. It's one of my favorite papers by Walters and Kitchell from 2001, Canadian Journal. Cultivation depensation is the effect. That's what that's what they called it. So. This is illustrated by something that could be uh, the uh, caught in the um, on the Grand Banks. Before the collapse, you had a big population of adult cod, and below it, you have that juvenile. No, the, to the left, the grey one there. That's the juvenile cod. And the argument here is that cod cultivates the Grand Banks for their juveniles. They typically have a separation of adult and juvenile. So there's a, there are mechanisms for keeping the adults and juveniles separate. That's most uh, fish species will have that kind of mechanism. And then there are the th competitors. Now, in this case here, it's something like polar cod, which is over on the right. Now, polar cod small polar cod and small juvenile may be eating the same food. Uh, the cod may be eating the polar cod and keeping them down. So they may be cultivating the sea by feeding on the competitors of their own juveniles. Can you see that? That's pretty, uh, it's interesting. And as such, keeping the system going for hundreds or thousands or millions of years by being dominant, maybe not millions of years, but uh, who knows uh, how 
because things do change with the environment and other things. You might get different dominating species, but once they're dominating, species tend to hang on for quite a while. And it is an interesting thought, isn't it, that that may be because that they are cultivating the ocean for their own species. Now, if we go in and we have a collapse, could be fishery, it could be often it is fishery environment. That's actually what we found in in the previous study that uh, fishery could explain some of these collapses, but far from everyone. Uh, on a fairly big proportion of it, it was the environment that was causing it, it was not fishing. So after the collapse, suddenly, oh, polar cod, if that's the species, or arctic cod, or whatever they're called, we don't know it, but that could be, it's a potential species, might have been building up, more of them, leading to, they feeding on the juvenile cod. And that's something we've seen for sure in the uh, on the East Coast, that the natural mortality of juvenile cod has gone up after the collapse. And it has been too high to allow recovery. That's why the issue seems to be. Now, in this situation here, when you have the depensation, you have what was a prey and competitor becoming a, a predator and competitor for a juvenile. So that's the, that's the mechanism. Who knows how common it is, because we're not looking at, uh, too much after it, but it's been 20 years now since this study came out, and we don't have that many examples of it. But I, I do find it as uh, stimulating to think about this and look for this uh, where can where can they be? It may well be that the reason why we don't see more of it is that it's not. It's like the murder in the Orient Express. There's not just one. It's not just one species it keeps down. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. It's a messy picture, as Jason Link called it. That it's a complicated food web. So when you have a dominating species like the cod on the Grand Banks, really dominating, 7 million tons of them. They eat a lot of different things. So they have a big impact on the ecosystems and they are successful. That's one of the reasons why they are that is that they keep potential predators on the, on the juveniles down. They have the separation in space with their own juveniles. So they, um, they can have this effect. But it's a messy picture. I think that's one reason why we don't see more published studies documenting this. Uh, it's, it's the complication of living, of dealing with marine systems. Uh, we often see things like cascading and that kind of effect more clearly in simpler uh, ecosystems. I'm not saying freshwater systems per se are simpler, but uh, in in some cases they are, and that tends to be where we see these simpler effects uh, more clearly. One more aspect of this is range contraction. Um, when you have, and it's not just small pelagics that stick together. Uh, cod do it too, schooling fish. Uh, the reason why cod was fished down was that was range contraction was a big part of it. That as um, population is decreasing, be it to environment and or fishing, their range contracts. And that means that it's still possible for um, fisheries to find them. And uh, that can happen also, for instance, with localized spawning concentrations. They may be targeted by, um, also by, for instance, uh, pinnipeds or other marine mammals, so that um, even as the population gets smaller and smaller, because they come together to spawn in like herring does, uh, you have all lots of predators and fisheries aggregating on that area, leading to depensatory predation mortality and density dependent casabilities for the fisheries. Those two effects come into the picture. So um, the range contraction is an additional factor making it very hard to come back again from a collapse. 
you can model the last part here with density bending capabilities in um, in Ecosystem. Yeah, we talked about that before. Some of the things we learn from this is for EWE model. Um, for, for key species, it might be a good idea to use multi stanza groups because you get a better representation of stock recruitment relationship. Um, I do think that the Lenfer study, that there were issues there that uh, they didn't, that was not part of the considerations. Um, yeah, stock recruitment is an emergent property in the ecosystem, it's not predefined. Uh, which actually just makes it more interesting the way we model it. It really is based on the conditions that the adults and juveniles experience. Uh, that's what defines the um, how, how big the recruitment is. And it tends to be something that looks like a built on hold recruitment. We are also concluding that well-managed forage fisheries can coexist with other fisheries. It may take a long time to recover once you had the collapse, a longer time than just predicted from simple models. Though the simple models that Carl Walters made actually explains part of this. Um, the key for avoiding the trade-offs between fisheries and predators on the, importantly, the forage fisheries, is to keep the forage fish in a safe zone where collapse, the risk of collapse is small. And finally, a trade off between forage fisheries and marine mammals and birds are often stronger. That, uh, and and lots, of, lots of focus is now on, and lots of research is now on those trade offs and those impacts. We are seeing more and more cases. And you have to see this in in an environment where top-down effects have been something that fishery scientists have kind of disregarded for, for, for a long, long time, uh, tending not to talk about it. And it's a new world in, the, in, in, in more than one way here, in the sense that when fishery science really started after well, 50, 70 years ago, where we really got it. it was 70s is 50 years ago is when we got into managing fisheries. That happened in a world where uh, there had been culling going on for very long time on notably marine mammals and birds for that matter too, marine birds. Uh, people were eating them and people were seeing them as competition for uh, um, with fisheries. I mean, after the war, there was surplus, some of the surplus uh, weapons and so on was used very, very uh, ingeniously, quotation mark, uh, here in BC, they were uh, mounting um, uh, machine guns on, uh, on some of the uh, fisheries uh, inspection vessels here so that they could shoot uh, things like uh, uh, whale sharks and, and uh, things that have absolutely no, to, no impact on, uh, on basically anything. Uh, but to eradicate that and eradicate predators because of perceived conflict with fisheries. They were, uh, they even had for, for the whale sharks, they had trying to put a big sword in front of the boat so they could ram them. and, and uh, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that the world has changed from that period there where the fisheries really started. There was generally a very low abundance of uh, marine mammals, in many cases also birds. And uh, that meant that top-down effects from these groups were not pronounced. With the rebuilding of the population, this has changed, and we are now seeing more and more examples of top-down effects having impact. But we have had a history of not looking for it. So, not monitoring, not monitoring uh, prey concentrations. I mentioned the, the, the thing about sockeye and uh, stella sea lion, that paper. Well, there are very few samples of sea lion diets from the three or four weeks in, the, in, in summer, where 
uh, sockeye passes through and sockeye is not just sockeye sockeye was the foundation of the biggest fishery here and uh, it has declined a lot so it's actually something that has economic and social consequences ecological too to understand that and that's what i'm arguing for that we need to understand these top-down effects i think that's it we don't four out of five including that little introduction it's just because i think that it's really crazy to have five presentations in an hour but we don't fall out in in one and a half hour any questions only crickets crickets hmm. So shall we try the last one? If you eat ice cream too quickly, you get brain freeze. Is that correct? You can get that. Is that brain yeah. freeze called? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything similar concept if you eat presentations too quickly? I think it's overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, d definitely, these papers are, are 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 pretty cool. And there was one, the Walters 2005, where he tests uh, well, uh, the different uh, um, um, like scenarios with MSY. Yeah, brain meltdown. Good brain meltdown. Yeah, um, yeah. In the 2005 paper, um, we evaluate for ten ecosystems the ecosystem level we estimate ecosystem level maximum sustainable yield and compare that to the sum of maximum sustainable yield for the species in those ecosystem and the other rule that came out of that was uh, ecosystem level msy is less than sum of single species msy and it can be a little bit confusing to think about oh yeah so Ecosystem level MSY is less than the sum of single species MSY on one hand. And then on the other hand, you hear me saying for anchovy, when we look at it from the ecosystem perspective, we can fish it harder. The MSY is harder, higher, sorry, than it is. Well, the EA, no, the, it's at a higher, it's higher and at a higher effort fish mortality or fish mortality and of effort or fish mortality because it's the same um, than if you do it from a single species perspective because of the ecosystem effect and that's correct we see that but we don't see it for all of the species at the same time so uh, it's even if the ecosystem MSY is higher for anchovy it doesn't mean that when you do it for all of the species, you're getting something that's more than the sum of the individuals. That's a really bad explanation. Um, <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, but it could also be an introduction. Yeah. We have a question on, on the chat by Tube. Can we say F MSY aspect has better calculation for some trophic levels because some species has little interaction with other species? What provides easy solution for commercial species impact on each other? The, the question is if we are for such a species there will be there will still be an ecosystem effect. I don't know if you mean by better, if that's what you mean. Because as we start fishing the um, top predator, like bluefin tuna, as you start fishing bluefin tuna, or sharks on Kingman Reef, if you, when you start fishing shark on Kingman Reef, you are initially going to take out. Uh, you could. There are two sides here. Yes, as you as you fish them down, you are going to they are going to see the impacts of uh, more 
prey because they're further from carrying capacity. So that with the um, uh, Malthus, the logistic growth uh, equations, that's that's what's considered there. So it does take into consideration that as you move away from carrying capacity, you get more. That is in the standard MSY calculation. What's not there is the indirect impact from predator and prey. So yeah, uh, you're probably right that it would be better for top predators than it will be for things which are down in the food web and which impact the mortality one level up. In many systems, we're seeing replacement. As we start increasing fishing, we're seeing that we are pushing out some of the uh, predation mortality. So we're seeing, if we look at the total mortality, say for Menhaden in Gulf of Mexico or for Anchoveta of Peru, and we model, and we look at the total mortality for that group over time, for these groups over time, and we see the components and we see that predation mortality, so we have predation mortality and we have uh, fishing mortality. As we increase the fishing mortality, predation mortality goes down. Now, that's partly, and we're talking about a 40, 50 year time series, that's partly because of the fishing takes away the prey and it might impact the uh, predators, but it's also because we're fishing the predators. So there's a confounding effect there. Um, we have to remember what Ray Hilborn's argument there. It really matters what they are. Are they preying on the juveniles? Are they preying on the adults? That kind of things actually matters here. That was not a good answer. Uh, Mimi says. Mimi also has a question. Are you going to ask it, Mimi? Yeah, sure. So I was just wondering when you showed the uh, ecosystem based and single species based MSYs, I think you said that the the full compensation is always uh, above the single species when you don't take into account the ecosystem effects. Is that correct? I dare not say always. Typically then? Typically they would be... Uh... We so often see that. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was asking then, does that mean that single species stock assessments would sort of have a built in precaution in their calculated fishing mortalities because they don't take into account the relaxation of real ecosystem effects? Yes, it does. Uh, there is a study by, um, oh, Oh, come on. It was a working group. We had a working group uh, in, in Denmark. Uh, publication. I'll, I'll pass on the publication to you that looked at the estimation of MSY because there are a number of factors that are not considered. And generally, the MSY that are used, for instance, by ISIS tend to be very, very, very precautionary for two reasons. One is um, that that there are a number of factors that don't consider ecosystem effects, uh, number of density dependent effects and other effects. Um, the, uh, the, on top of that, they built into them a precautionary principle. Uh, so they, they, they have that built in and they are in the management adding a further one. So in that study, it's uh, Sparholt 2020, Henrik Sparholt made that study, I, and I will uh, pass it on. Uh, the conclusion is that the, basically that we, that the sustainable yield from the Northeast Atlantic could be increased considerably. Yes, there's definitely a very strong precautionary uh, approach in this. Part of it is also that the uh, methods were set out when the fish populations were at a really low level. For many of them, they had been, when we're talking about, uh, go back 20 years, we're talking about a period of sustained overfishing. Those populations have rebuilt, but one has kept the approaches for MSY as they were 20 years ago. 
and once they are rebuilt, these species tend to be uh, more resilient. So I do think it's time to revisit the, the, how FFMSY is done. And, and that's what the Sparholz study, the working group that, that he led, uh, that's, that's where, that's what is what that study has aimed to do. Yeah, that's interesting because um, my impression was always that the the ICs approaches, which are predominantly using single species stock assessments, that they leave out ecosystem effects and therefore that they were um, less precautionary in a sense that that because they don't take into account the other impacts, the impacts on other species, non-target species. But it sounds like by focusing uh, only on the species as independent that the calculated fishing mortality is lower than uh, in, in a sense it, needs to be. Then it, then um, it might so, have been, yeah. yeah. I, because one of the things that happening is that we fish harder is that we replace in predation mortality with fishing mortality. And yeah, and that can have an impact uh, on on the predators. And this is a point where you have to remember what what Ray was pointing forward, uh, uh, pointing out was that in many cases, uh, we see less of those effects than we expect. And it may well be because of uh, predators taking their share before recruitment, if they're relying on taking the populations before recruitment. It's a little bit complicated to figure this out, and there's no clear answer to it. Uh, I think that one thing that's clear is that we shouldn't ignore it. And yes, maybe there are definitely cases where the ecosystem considerations do not include at all the impact, or there were lots of those cases where management was done without any consideration of the ecosystem effects. But that is definitely changing. Um, there's more and more happening on bringing ecosystem effects into the picture. Uh, Jason Link talked about this uh, in, in the second week of, of this course here, or was the first, and uh, there are things happening there. NOAA is, uh, is pushing it and so, are, so is the uh, EU, so is ISIS. There's, there are lots of things happening on this front where of getting ecosystem considerations in. So they are uh, becoming more inclusive in this inclusive of ecosystem effects in management i did some some stock assessments with the with rain frozy and he was highlighting that uh, when you use parameters like like resilience of a species and then that parameter uh, somehow reflects the ecosystem uh, interactions and then that is covered that requirement is covered in the estimates of like uh, MSY. That is the comment I wanted to make. Okay, thank you. Yeah, to some extent, yeah. So one of the questions that we that we raised here was, um, so how do we figure out how much can, can we extract from an ecosystem? And uh, years ago, uh, we um, developed this policy exploration routine, which in essence got us into the room where it happened, we thought, you know, where there was uh, the balancing of the clerical, social and economic aspects. And I was really intrigued uh, the years ago when we did that, because suddenly we could, we could use these ecosystem models to come up with a prescription for how we should manage, could manage ecosystem, not should, how we could manage ecosystem, what the consequences would be of that. So how to incorporate that predators eat prey and also that things have different prices, uh, the social and the economical aspect of how we manage it. Uh, this was a tool that enabled us to participate in that discussion. Now, things have matured in, in thinking about that since then, but let's have a look at uh, what it does. It, because it very much addresses the question we had before about, so uh, you can come up with an MSY for this species and for this species and for that species. But what about if we look at the whole ecosystem? How do we do that? 
And that becomes complicated then because there are trade-offs. So what we build in to Ecosim is a formal optimization methods that allows us to search for a fishing policy that would max maximize a, par a particular objective function. So we can set a goal, a policy goal, and develop an objective function for management. And we can, for instance, uh, uh, say it, well, let's optimize for the whole fishery sector, everything, or fleet by fleet, or however we want to do it. Highlight here as a warning that these optimizations are highly dependent on your initial ecosystem model, what's in your model. Density dependence, carrying capacity, hence the vulnerability settings. So it is strongly advised to fit the model to time series data uh, if you want to use this routine for anything a bit more applied as part of the management process. So we can we have at the moment five optimizations objectives that are built into it. First one there is net economic value, which is basically just the landed value of the catch less the operating cost to take this landed value. You can think of that as the Wall Street option. That would pull the fishery, the whole fishing industry in the direction of maximizing profit. That's what Wall Street's investors want. So this is what the investors want. They want money out of it. Then there is more like the union perspective on this, which is employment. That's a social indicator. And we set it up so that we're saying, how many jobs are there per landed value? And that's again going to push it in a different direction. It's going to push things in direction of getting more money out of it. So not worrying about profit, but worrying about how much money can we extract from this because that money means jobs. So that puts in one direction. Another one is mandated view building. Uh, this pulls us into a direction uh, as when you have legislation Especially in the US, this can be a very strong factor when you have a judge coming out and say, you are not allowed to fish in this area before this species has rebuilt to a certain level because of, of these, uh, there are some legislation about protection of, of these animals. So uh, that will again pull it into a, 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 one, a third direction possibly. That's one where, oh, it might stop the fishing. But in our version is much smarter than the one that comes out of uh, what a judge says, you shall not fish. Because we might actually, in, in this version here, when we are optimizing for mandate rebuilding, having the fleets go out and kill the fish, the predators of this group, or fish the competitors of this group, so that there will be more uh, food for that target species that has to rebuild. There's also species diversity built in something uh, where we look thinking uh, well thinking is if we get a more um, even distribution of biomasses across the ecosystem it probably results in if we move in that direction it would result in a more stable ecosystem so with species diversity we can push it in that direction and then the last one ecological structure the fifth way we can push the system uh, is related to autumn's maturity that we built talked about before, where a mature ecosystem is one where the average longevity of, of what's in that ecosystem is high. So if we can push it so that things become more long-lived, we like to get more stable situation. And more long-lived actually means lower production biomass ratio. So we're taking the inverse production biomass ratio, biomass over production. How much biomass is there relative to production? Kingman Reef, lots of biomass, little production. That's a very uh, high indicator for this ecological structure. So we are maximizing the long, some longevity. We take the biomass times the inverse, the longevity, inverse PB, the BP ratio, multiply B times B divided by P uh, for that group. 
B squared over P is, is the average longevity weighted by species. So we have these five different measures. And of course, uh, as, um, as Ray Hilborn said in the video, uh, if Congress would only tell us what they want, then we can, we can do that. You know, that's the problem. You can't get anyone to tell you what, what they want uh, with regards to, to these. So that's an issue that uh, we have to live with. Okay, here is just the same that I've just been talking about. These are the five axes we have. Maximize profit, social benefit, rebuilding, species diversion, or ecosystem structure. And we could put it into a nice um, equation like this. Where the interesting thing is, if you look at that equation, there's a W1, W2, W3, W4, W5. They um, are weighting factors that we have to put on each of them. So we have to say how much weight do we put on each of those. And when you think about it from the ecosystem perspective, that's what impacts. How much will the profit pull me that way? And how much will the jobs pull me that way? And mandate rebuilding that way? And ecosystem structure that way? And the uh, species diversity in that direction? How do you uh, react to all these different pushes in, in different direction? That's what we are, we are uh, aiming for. And next slide tells is something really rare. Daniel Pauly doesn't really tell jokes, but I remember many years ago he told told me a joke about a, a, a beggar who sits outside the uh, metro in uh, in Paris, holds up a sign. Here I just photoshopped a, a drawing and put what was what Daniel said there on it. So so he sits there, a panhandler, and he has. A leg, uh, he has a sign that says one more, one lost leg, two wives, and one ulcer equals five. And people come and say, you can't do that. You can't sum these things up. They're not uh, comparable. And he said, well, it's five miseries. And, um, oh, see, that's what I'm telling you that because it's the only joke I can I, I uh, remember Pauli uh, telling, almost. Uh, but the main thing about it is what do you do when you have something which is not comparable? And these things are certainly are not comparable. So he found a way of adding it up, of course, to, to get something in his cup there. But this is what we tasked with. So the way, maybe next slide, the way we are approaching this is that to balance these objectives. First of all, we are standardizing everything relative to the base value. So equal weighting means that we put in the same value on increasing uh, things with a profit with 10% or jobs with 10%. That's what equal weighting means that, but because it's relative, you know, it's not like summing up dollars and summing up uh, biomasses or longevity, it's how much does it change? So if we put down one across the board, it would mean that uh, those that are easy to change would have the biggest weight. It may be easier to change profits than to change longevity in the ecosystem or diversity in the ecosystem, for instance. So you have to, when you run this, you have to play with it. There's no um, way of saying this is to optimize across the ecosystem or do them one by one and see what happens if you optimize for one thing or if you happen to another thing. I'll come back to that. Just want to mention that uh, we can define it very simple without the value chain, but we can also include the value chain. And that way, we, the jobs come from the value chain, the profit comes from there, and so on. So that's actually pretty neat. And the big issue is, what do we do about this objective function? How do we define that? So let's look at that. Next. Uh, this is an example where, where I ran 400 simulation. And I, in this case here, I tried to see 
what if I put a weight on jobs on one axis and profit on the other axis? And it's only to illustrate that there may be pathways where you can consider job and profit. So these are replicates. So if you start for each of these graphs in the lower left corner and then goes up in a straight line some direction, you can you might be able to see um, that there are there is an area where you can get a lot of profit. Uh, we're still doing okay with jobs, where ecology is not. So a little bit below the one-to-one -one line is what I would think this here points to with regards to just these two axes. Um, if you, can you, uh, Santiago, can you try to go up a little bit below the, where the, where the separation is there between orange and, and lighter? On each plot, you can see here you're doing just below there, you're doing okay with profit. You go to the next one, you're still doing okay with jobs. Uh, below there, just below there, because when you go to ecology, you see roughly that's where you want to be. You want to don't don't impact the ecology too much. The diversity is okay here as well. The traffic level of the catch is high. We don't use that for optimization; it's just an indicator. Yeah, it's still a high traffic level, and catch is not the weight is not too high, but but the jobs, the value is okay of what's there, so it's high value things. So there may be compromises. That's what I'm showing with this plot here. Next. Uh, old study, let's just, because of time, just go on. It just says the same, that there are trade-offs. Next one. Um, now, in this one here, only thing I want to say, this is uh, the previous one. Ah, okay. Here, if when you look at this, uh, without going into detail, if you just take the top line there, operating on the right, top right one, operating for profit, you can see, oh, it's, uh, some, there are some extremes there. Optimizing for uh, like 25 times higher profit from something, or optimizing for jobs, lots of things, big effort coming up, and you get these extremes when you do it. Um, one by one, call it when models go rogue, you know, that's when you need to put in constraints. There are various ways of doing that, so one has to be a little bit careful with it. But, next slide. This is where I think the value really is when we're working with this. Uh, we're not trying to be prescriptive, we're not trying to say you should do this and that. But what we can do here is we can make this kind of radar spider a movie bit plot where you can say if we were to optimize for, let's say, uh, rent for profit, it could be, it doesn't matter which one of these it is, uh, how far could we bring the model? That would be the outer colored ring. And then we can compare that to a given realization, for instance, where we are now. That could be the inner colored here. Can you see that? We can say something about the current state, where that is relative to an optimized state. So that certainly is one way of using this. Just to come up, use it to provide reference values and options for what, what, where could we do better? Where are we doing good? I think this is a, a, a way of, of using it that um, lends itself very easily to actual use. Coming up with how to balance those five apses in an objective function is something that is really, really, really difficult because no policy maker or even manager wants to be accused of robbing Peter to pay Paul, to benefiting one fishery at the cost of another fishery, for instance, making some people unemployed in order to employ others, you know, in different parts of the fishery sector. That's something that, that's a discussion they would rather not talk about because even talking about it is enough that they would be afraid that the voters or someone else would be deeply worried about that uh, discussion there. So it's much better to 
ignore it. And my argument is we don't have to ignore it. We can use ecosystem models and approaches like this to inform uh, about what is possible. And I think this here is a good example of this. So the actual implementation in the last few minutes is a screen like this. And what you'll notice here is you can, uh, it's pretty cute and encourage you to play with it. So what you need to know is up on the top where it says blocks and number of blocks, that's just colors. And a color here, once it's down in the table below, the spreadsheet below, means find me an effort. So the detailed setup here is one where the first year is black. Black means that it doesn't change the effort. It's whatever is an echo sim that's going to be used. And then in this default setup, it will estimate one effort for each fleet. And you can change that. You can have any number of colors by changing the number of blocks. And then you can say, oh, I want to have a five year rebuilding and then a different color or break it into sections. And uh, yeah, the model will, will then run. A very important thing is when you run it that you over on the left where it says um, initialize using. The default there is echo part base F. Change that to random F so uh, it starts at a random place. Otherwise it very easily gets stuck and goes nowhere if you start with a base F. It seems to just be leaving it there. This is a really complicated optimization routine that's behind it. It's like going out searching for the biggest mountain up in the range with blindfolded with a long stick. That's what we're trying to do with this one here. So it matters where you start. You can get stuck in the local minima. It's easy enough to check it just by doing uh, asking it to say the number of runs over on the left. If you try to set that to two or three or four or five, you can see does it end up with something very similar. That's that's what you're looking for. It's explained uh, in the tutorial, so I'm suggesting that you uh, you try it, work with it, and see how it works. And uh, if you're using the very 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 not even not the newest release, but the uh, versions that comes the unofficial releases that come later. I don't think uh, the class as such is not doing, but individuals of you might be doing it. There are some issues and it doesn't work properly, so it's best to use the, re the uh, released version for this. That's what works best right now. We're fixing the other things. How does the policy search come up with the reference points? Um, oh, it's just if you maximize first for profit, net economic value, you can see how far it can take it. So you're getting an estimate for the the maximum profit in the ecosystem. So that defines one axle on the amoeba. And then you can see what you actually have there. And next you do it for jobs and, you, and it goes to some extremes about overexploitation. And you can see how far, so you can get an idea about where the outer red ring is and where, where you are actually in your model uh, in a current situation or in a proposed scenario. You know, if you run a scenario for how management may be, then you can compare it to how far could they be? How much more could we do? Doesn't mean we want to go to maximize profits, but we can at least see where we are on that axis. We are getting 20% of the maximum profit, uh, but we are getting 40% or 60% of the jobs. And the ecosystem structure is close to optimal. You know, you can, there's a narrative around this. and. That's one thing I really, when we started working this, found intriguing that we would be able to participate in that discussion. That's what I called before the room where it happened. You know, we can sit there at the table and actually say something about uh, where are we, where could we be, uh, what are the con these consequences. That's throwing a light on the trade-offs.